Okay, I guess we are all familiar with this view, right? Pretty slow uploading. And we can't do much about it, right? Like, right now, we are all connected to the same Wi-Fi network, like this auditorium Wi-Fi handles 500 people right now, and we can't buy faster connection, right? There is no way we can do it. So maybe, as a developers, we can do something that our apps will accept files faster, so it will seem like it's uploading faster. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about in those five minutes. Because, you know, downloading is fast. Your network is often really fast when downloading, often something like 10 times faster than uploading. And there is a bonus there, because when you download data from the internet, it's often compressed. Your server sometimes uses uh, libraries like Zlib and algorithms like uh, gzip to compress data that you download. So HTML, JavaScript, CSS, it's all compressed. Uh, and they have those fabulous logos from 90s. Uh, so maybe can we compress data when uploading? Maybe we can try to do the same thing, you know, not downloading, but uploading. And we can. There is a JavaScript library called Paco that does exactly this, the thing we want. It's a Zlib port to JavaScript very fast. So just we go to their GitHub, download it, and use it like this, paco.deflate, and then we throw our file there. Enough talking, time for a demo, I guess. Uh, you can see a link uh, up ahead, uh, and it's a simple example application, and there is a link to short blog post on this topic if you want to get more technical. Uh, so I recommend you go to CodePen and try it yourself, or you can just Google for Paco upload, and it should be like up the top. Anyway, back to the example. Uh, as you can see, this is some simple file upload form. It's not really uploading anything. It will just simulate uploading uncompressed files and compressing the file and uploading compressed version with the selected network speed. So we need some files. We have some 3D JSON. We have some STL, which is a 3D model. Uh, we also have huge uh, text files like CSV, log files, some files that don't compress well, like images, movies, keynote file. And uh, one interesting thing are those PSD files. Uh, just take a look at facebook.psd. It's over 400 megabytes in size, and it's just Facebook logo. I'm not sure what they did there, but it's enormous. Okay, so first let's take a look at files that don't compress well. So images, if we throw an image here, it will just start uploading, and then the packed version will start uploading, but we don't see any gain here because images are already compressed. The same goes for videos, and if we throw Keynote here, it just blows up because Keynote is not really a file, it's a directory, doesn't matter. But what about files that do compress well? Let's throw a PSD file here. And we can see we saved a few megabytes. If we throw this huge facebook.psd and wait for a bit because it has to process 500 megabytes of data, but once it does, we can see that it got much, much smaller. And just see how much faster the upload gets. The same goes for GIMP files. And now we can just try this with all those text files like JSON, like STL, and on average, we go, go down like five times in size, sometimes even more. So that's quite a huge gain. And if you're uploading files like this in your application, there is something you should definitely try and check if you can, and check if you can just have some gain, check if you can have some improvement with it. And if you do, don't forget to let me know so I know that I have helped you. Thank you. Thank you. I, so I'm Alex Lakatos, and I do a bunch of th different things. Uh, for, for starters, I'm a JavaScript developer advocate for Nexmo. And in my spare time, I volunteer for Mozilla. I'm a, a tech speaker and a reps council member. Uh, but at heart, I still remain like a front-end developer, and I think I'll always be that. 
And I want to show you guys some of the productivity hacks I use for my dev tools. Uh, I'm showing you what I do on Firefox, but everything I show you is translatable to Chrome and other dev tools as well. Uh, <clears throat> So how do you open up DevTools? The most, like the easiest way is to just right click and do inspect element and uh, DevTools appears on page. Now, I have this, uh, this website which is kind of buggy. It's my excuse for a blog which I never use. Uh, but I want to show you guys how I, uh, how I edit it. So for example, uh, if you look at the button, it's kind of orange and not red, the same as the links. How do I, uh, how do I go to the button? So, I could right click and inspect that element as it would snap to it. Uh, but the websites I work on are uh, layout heavy, a lot of Z index and stuff like that. So uh, it's element on top of element on top of element, which is hard to select. So there's the search feature right there. Uh, you can power it up with like command F uh, or anything else. But the cool part about it, it is uses CSS selectors to select anything on a page. So I know my button is uh, an MDL button. And then uh, if I search for it, I can see I have four instances of it on the page. Uh, if I keep, keep searching for it, it's gonna pop up eventually, so that's my, uh, that's my button. Now, if I wanna change the color of my button, there's a bunch of CSS attached to it. Uh, I should have to scroll through it and figure out which one's color. Uh, easier is I just filter for styles, and everything that has a color attached to it, like a color in the name pops up. And that's even like nested styles and stuff like that. So I'm gonna scroll until I see my background color or my color, which is, well, it's this thing here, which is red, green, blue. I, I don't really know how that works. I think Martin had a talk this morning which explained how this works. I, I still forgot, so I'm gonna just say red, right? And that changes the, the color of my button. Now, one of the other problems I have, I used to work with a bunch of big teams and those had like style guides. And the uh, style guide says, well, the color has to be a hex color, right? How do I figure out if, what's the hex color for red? Uh, when I started developing, you used to go online, there was a website for it, you typed in red, it showed you the hex color. Uh, but now, I've got this little dot in here, so if I shift click on it, it's gonna display all representations of the color I have in there. So red has like hex, uh, hue, saturation, and light, and red, green, blue. Uh, and I can circle to it, I can find out what the hex color is, right? Uh, if I look at the website, maybe the projector, uh, like the resolution isn't that good, but it's not the same shade of red as what I have in there. Uh, I, I'm not gonna like change this until I get it just right. That would be insane. And I, it would take a long time. What I can do is, if I click on that colored circle in there, a color picker pops up. Now, I'm not gonna try to match it, because I'm never gonna get it. I'm half colorblind anyway. But I have this little color picker in there that just lets me go on the page and select it from somewhere else I have it. And voila. Uh, so now, uh, that was basically part of what I do to hack my CSS to make me more uh, more effective, but I've got other issues. For example, if I hover over this button, I have a shadow on it, and I kind of don't want that. Now, as soon as I hover out, well, I can't inspect it anymore, but I can force the hover state. If I go to the element uh, in DevTools, I can right-click that and say somewhere in there, uh, hover. So I can force hover state on it. Now, I have, a, I have an indicator in there to like remind me uh, that it's there, and if I force hover state, I can just say background color somewhere in there. This is how we fail on stage, in like 10 seconds. Okay, I got it right in 10 seconds. And I can say white. And now, if I disable it, I can actually test that it works. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom. I'm Liran. And we are here from, we work at Wix.com, uh, which, for those of you who don't know, is a platform for creating websites with millions of users all around the world. And we are here to share in these five minutes some insights we had from making Wix sites accessible. We hope you enjoy it. 
So why should we care about accessibility anyway? First of all, we want to make the internet available for everyone. And for, by everyone, I mean also people with disabilities, such as blindness or inability to use mouse. Also, we're seeing laws all over the world that are requiring uh, site owners to make their sites accessible. This is like a store that has to have a ramp for a wheelchair that some people just can't use if it doesn't happen. So about six, about six months ago, um, we got the task, we started working on making weak sites accessible, and we need to do this now due to this law that is going on in Israel. Uh, so we started by asking ourselves what actually makes a site accessible. So when we say an accessible site, it needs to be perceivable by everyone. And when I say by everyone, I mean, for example, that an image that you have on your site should be perceivable by a blind person. It should be operable. So as Liran mentioned, there are some people who are unable to use a mouse, for example. So if someone is unable to use a mouse or uses some speech recognition software, they should still be able to see, use, and interact with your programs. It should be understandable, which says something about the meaning and the content of stuff, but it also says something about the order. The order of stuff needs to make sense. Now, we'll see this in a bit. It may sound a bit trivial currently, but it's really not. Uh, uh, and of course, we want it to be as compatible with as many uh, assistive technologies as possible. We want it to be as inclusive as possible to make the internet truly available for everyone. So when we started this task, we first started by wanting to understand how screen readers really work, how a blind person experiences Wix sites. So we opened up Safari, we opened VoiceOver, which is free on that, and we opened this and heard this sound. 369F374527438F839A D65E58086.webp. We were not happy. <laughs> now, Liran, you want to say what the hell was that? Okay, so this is how blind people see this image that has no alt text on it. So basically, screen reader, and how does that work? So screen reader uh, basically interprets an accessibility tree that is being built by the browser according to the HTML DOM and only the HTML DOM. Okay, now when you say only the HTML DOM, so we need to remember this is the document that we write, body, all kinds of HTML tags on, and Let's think about, for a second, what that currently looks like in the developer landscape. And basically, it pretty much looks like this. Uh, now, I don't know about you guys, but if you looked at most of the sites out there like, uh, that have not made serious accessibility efforts yet, most of the components there are just divs. Um, now, I want to see that this is really a universal problem, whether it is. So please raise your hand if you ever used a div on your website, if you ever wrote a div. And if you ever, please leave your hands up only if you also use the table ever. And leave your hands up if you use the figure and the fig caption. And how about an article and the side and footer? OK, so there are still some hands up, which is great, but the hands went down. <laughs> uh, OK, and why do we do this? Well, basically, for two reasons. One, it's easy just to use divs, and the second is that we are afraid of the default browser styling, which may destroy our styling, and we have to take control of it. But there are actually solutions for that. So now I want to play a game. Uh, as Tom mentioned, we see a lot of divs. So this is uh, part of code that was in weak sites lately. Uh, basically, I'm looking at it, and I can't tell what it is, and it could be anything in the world. And uh, just by making a small adjustment, like that, I can tell the browser and the whole world that this is actually the footer. How about this one? All I see here is two links wrapped with some divs. I don't know what that is, what, what that's all about. It could be also a footer, but just by making this adjustment, it's now really easy to see that this is the main menu of the site. And even if it didn't have the ARIA label, I can still see that this is a list with a nav tag. So this is the, the main issue. We are saying that Basically, you want your HTML to be semantically correct. How do you do it right? Well, it's not easy, but you can start by asking yourself the right questions. The kind of questions you need to ask yourselves are almost like metaphysical, philosophical, deep questions. Like, I'm writing a menu now. What is this component? What is its role in the overall page that I'm building? Uh, is there any text that I can add? Thank you. Hello, people. Uh, so. Uh... I'd like to show you some um, software. I don't think uh, 
it's necessary for you to use it because uh, you are fine with routing, but it's just another approach for uh, routing. Uh, I use this approach uh, also on the backend. This is the frontend library once, and I've reduced the uh, configuration file, which uh, has like thousands of definitions, and there was no definitions, because I believe we can automate routing, and we should treat a URL as a store. So this is just the uh, demo of it. Uh, uh, we, I'm using here uh, Param, which is, uh, uh, which is just, uh, let's say, I'm asking if night is true. And um, I can toggle it. Um, mm -hmm. And it works on site. Uh, the library of, uh, of this routing is uh, agnostic uh, in terms of the technology. You can use it with React, with, with whatever you want. And I think it's cool uh, because uh, usually it's really tightly coupled with your um, library. Um, so we see. Um, I have param name, I'm just uh, writing it and it's updated all the time because I'm, with, with each key I'm just writing. But it's uh, much more clever because uh, as you will see, here is the param amount which I'm using on this, uh, uh, on this page. And you can see it's already a number, uh, so I can add, add to it. Uh, so um, just uh, look here. Uh, I have getters and setters for it, so I have all the tools we, we want to, to have in store. Uh, so I'm casting to a number, I'm even uh, setting default uh, value for one. Uh, also, while writing, uh, I'm, I'm defining like, I don't want to write this value if it's uh, lower than two. So if you will uh, check the URL, it's just uh, disappearing uh, if it's one, and it's one by default. Um, so I'm just operating on, on real, um, real object all, all the time and not casting it like uh, I'm not uh, so so the alternative what we are doing uh, is like we are uh, regexping a, a string to take some data from URL and why um, we are writing like imagine you are just writing by hand JSON because you want to communicate something and then you're parsing it with regex instead of uh, serializing and deserializing things uh, so that's my assumptions Assumption and let's check what's the object. Uh, was that the object? It's date, so let's check how it looks uh, in console. Um, it's real um, date object. I have some uh, logic here, like uh, I will not uh, go uh, to yesterday on this object. That's uh, somewhere in setter or, or getter. I don't, I don't know. Let's go for the more impressive uh, demo thing. So you can serialize everything like, like this. Um, and it's just the image. Let's go and make from this, Im uh, this is real image already, it was canvas before. So let's just copy our state, open, and, and this is the same, uh, the same stain in different applications. So the side effect of this uh, approach, uh, like you have really convenient tool to use uh, to define root, roots, you don't define roots uh, at all, they are just uh, serialized. Uh, so it's pretty convenient tool. And the side effect is like you can uh, do this serverless thing, like you can send your standalone application by email. You can uh, set some state, let's say, uh, order some, uh, um, some goods online, and then send the email with your state, like with uh, your um, things which you, which you uh, ordered by email, and then on the, on the um, uh, provider side, he can open the same. So there is no server inside, you can, uh, it's just the side effect. I, I, I'm using this approach uh, uh, and it's really um, easy for me for uh, any kind of complexity of application. I'm just not defining, I, I'm not defining roots uh, by myself. So one more thing, uh, if you'd like to uh, go to Reactive Conference uh, next month in Bratislava, just ask me, I have discount code for that. And that's all, thank you. Hello, Full Stack Fest. I, my name is Kirill Piminev, and I'm a leaf proof that you can have a full-time job as a Rust programmer. And today I'm going to tell you that you should learn Rust, then go back to your language, and that will make you better at the language you're writing day to day. 
And uh, Rust is a compiled, multi-paradigm, whatever. If you're interested in that stuff, go Wikipedia. Uh, for what's interesting for us is the Rust is a compiler with the most picky compiler you can imagine. So there are lots of programs which are valid in other languages, but they have subtle bugs, and Rust compiler is designed to catch those bugs. So let me show you, just in code examples, how other languages uh, allow you to make mistakes and how Rust compiler will, will catch it. And we will uh, do the really easy task. We will write a small function which receives the vector of numbers and it will remove all the zeros out of there. A really trivial thing. And yeah, I understand not every one of you can write C++. I cannot write C++, so this is how you do it. It's pretty normal, pretty boring function, and I think everyone can understand it, but do you know how they're going to use it, actually? They're going to use it multi-threaded, and now you're screwed. It's bad because the function goes through your vector, and it locates the length of the vector, and it removes something in place, and if you start doing that in multiple threads at the same time, you will end up with clashes going out of a, some values going out of a scope and other threading issues. I understand everyone who ever deployed something multi-threaded have seen those issues. And this is still perfectly valid C++ program. You will be able to compile it and compiler will sell no nothing to you. Yeah, this is why we invented other languages like Ruby. This is valid Ruby program doing exactly the same. And it is good because it won't have those multi-threading issues. But it will be damn slow. And it will be slow because in that uh, reject method, they're making mutex on every iteration, on every attempt you're doing. And even if you are not doing multi-threading, you're still paying additional price for the mutexes. So let's see how the same program can be expressed in Rust. And if you see look at this code, it's pretty close to what we wrote in Ruby, not to what we wrote in C++. But this com program won't compile, because we are doing that mistake, we are passing the same vector into multiple threads, and this is not a valid thing to do, and this is how compiler will say us. You see, there is a numbers vector, and you are passing it around, and you are not passing it around careful enough. Please fix it. They give you some example uh, how you can fix it. Obviously, you cannot still fix it with uh, move semantics, which is not what I'm going to explain to you right now. But the thing is, this is what you will see the first two weeks you are writing Rust all the time. And this is why I think it is a good thing to do, because after you figure out what compiler wants from you, what's this move semantic, what's this ownership thing, you can still apply it to your Ruby code, you can still apply it to your C++ code, whatever code you're writing, and you will be able to avoid threading bugs, memory safety bugs, and uh, generally the right programs which are faster and safer and will save you lots of time. So this is mostly about developing a special mental muscle which will help you avoid these mistakes, and after you move back to your language, this same muscle will save you from the same class of errors if your language is not supporting you anymore. And yeah, just to recap, this is how I'm making it right. And you see that I'm doing mutexes, I'm doing them explicitly, but I'm locking it and just dropping it. And Rust takes care of unlocking mutex after it's no longer needed. Also quite an efficient. Thank you all, that's it, don't rust. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raj. I work as a senior iOS developer uh, at Tommy, Elfiger, and Calvin Klein. So uh, today, the topic I'm going to discuss about is uh, between communication between iOS devices. These days, mobile is everywhere. And, you know, and internet is also becoming a you know, very scarce resource here because people out here using internet might have faced with so many issues. Probably, I assume so. And uh, to avoid this kind of scenarios, you know, like we can have a communication among ourselves without no internet using a bonjour connectivity. So we don't require any REST APIs, we don't require any internet, we don't require anything, but still we can get all the data and everything is uh, under, you know, transmitted across all the devices. So uh, we had a kind of, you know, scenario in our office, like, you know, uh, a, a person comes to me and asks me, like, Raj, can you develop an application where I have to uh, communicate anonymously to one of my colleagues? So in that case, you know, he wants to hit on somebody, he can use this application to hit on. And, uh, and the, and the good part about this application is that you can explicitly tell who, are you, who you are or else you can just be an anonymous uh, guy out there in the application. And also it, in, it, it enables the user 
to communicate with the new joinings in our application in a very random way. Because when you see in uh, companies, like every group has their own set of people. Like nobody mingles with other, and everybody has their own set of territory. So to avoid this kind of problems, we just created a kind of an application where it helps others to you know like hit on somebody and trying to play around uh, others. So how did we do this one? So that's an uh, important thing. So the thing is that we used a, a thing called a Bonjour Connectivity. Bonjour Connectivity is nothing but a, a network, network discovery protocol. So each and every iOS devices has a kind of a network identifier. So the moment you turn on your Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, even both of the things, so each devices is identified through a kind of a network. So uh, when, I, when I switch on my Wi-Fi, when one of my colleagues switch on my Wi-Fi, so both devices are speaks to each other through a network discovery protocol. So uh, that's what we call it as a Bonjour connectivity. And it works via Bluetooth, it works via Wi-Fi, it works via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth together. And, and also the thing is that you can connect with users by uh, auto-connect, also you can connect by invitation also. So sometimes you feel like, why should I need to connect to this guy? Why should I need to connect to another guy? So you can always send an invitation to others to get, to get it connected. And this is how it works. The beautiful part about this one is, let's say uh, the user C is out of range of user A. So, but still a user A can speak to user C using user B. So now the user B can act like an amplifier, so which can act like a medium between user A and uh, C, where both people can talk to each other. So that's a beautiful part about this one. And you can have this kind of use cases everywhere. Let's say I'm coming to an office where I, I'm not able to find a person. So in that case, the person can share a location to me. I can identify he's exactly which floor he is in and where can I go and identify him through uh, somebody's internet, uh, somebody's uh, Wi-Fi, not internet. And, and also, there are a lot of use cases around this. Let's say I'm flying in a flight where there is no internet connectivity. So I want to talk to my friend who is at the back. So still, you can use this one to talk this one. You can do a streaming. You can do a file transfer. You can do a video call. You can do whatsoever you know, that you can imagine with uh, all your uh, Viber or Facebook or whatsoever. And, and an important part is that when somebody goes offline, let's say he's out of range. So in that case, whatever information that you wanted to share with other person shouldn't get lost. In that case, so uh, we have implemented something called a replicated distributed database. What happens is whenever somebody sends information to the already connecting guy, so all the information, when the guy is not there, we send a kind of a notification to the person B. Uh, saying that this guy is not there. So the information is cached on his network, cached on his device. Once the guy connects, automatically it gets transferred to only to the guys. So you can have always have a single to a person to person communication. Also you can have a person to a group communication. So it works in either ways. And how can you ensure security? Because security is an utmost importance these days. So uh, basically, we use a symmetric, symmetric uh, authentication as well as a, we use a kind of a transmitter ID, so which is always encrypted. And the channel we use here is like uh, uh, TLS, uh, TLS RSA with AES-256, which is one of the most encrypted uh, channel. So we, use, we, we make sure that all the information, whatever we transfer, is secured. So employee also feel you know, much confident and much happy that nobody is overseeing the network. So and that's it from my side. And one more thing. So you can uh, connect with me in uh, Twitter as well as uh, in uh, GitHub page. And also we are hiring. And I would like to thank my team, so who encourages me to uh, have a talk here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paolo. I was born here. I live here, I work at Bitcrown, I like Doge, I like my cat, I like math, no, yes. Uh, I like functional programming for that. Uh, it, fit my, it fits my mental map, many languages have it, and it just feels right to me. So this is a code I will write on a daily basis. This is just basically mapping an array of strings, and call them to integer, this will output me one, two, three. Same thing on Ruby, uh, one, two, three, two, I is basically one, two, three. But that doesn't happen on JavaScript. <laughs> so I couldn't apply my mental models directly. I had to read documentation and other stuff. Uh, just a note, this is not a rant about JavaScript. I really like the community uh, frameworks, libraries, underscore JS, React, are really good. Uh, but maybe I should use another language which will compile to JavaScript, like Elm, ClojureScript, JuraScript, or even Elixir script. Uh, so the, I did that, I used Elm to make a game, and it's a very simple Flappy Bird clone, but actually has a, a score right down there, which will put the three, top three players using WebSockets. So on the server side, I use Elixir, 
and more specifically, I use Phoenix WebSockets in OTP, which was nice because it also matched my mentor model. This is actually a function from the game. It will grab the game, apply gravity, physics, check the upper, upper limit, check the collision, update the pipes, and update the score. This is, you can see as very neat pipeline of computations. This is also from the game. This, will, this is the function that will update the score. This basically will filter, all, get all the pipes, filter the pipes that were, that were already passed, it will get the length of that list, and it will divide by two. And if the score is updated, I'll just update the score on the server. And this is a server code, which will get all the players, will sort them by score, and it will take three. Kind of similar and very nice. So just wrapping up, um, I'm not comfortable with JavaScript, and if you're not, just try other languages. Uh, make games, they're pretty cool. This is the URL, you can play it. And thank you, ping me on Twitter. So, oops, can you hear me? Ah, there it is. So hi, I'm Marta, I'm a web designer, and I'm part of the team that designed the full stack website. So. I have a small web design studio, it's called Sweet. I have the studio together with my husband, this is us. So, you know what to do, right? So when Codegram asked us to design this website, we were super happy uh, because we knew that this was gonna be a fun project. It was gonna be fun because we knew the main target audience were developers. It's always fun to design for developers. So the first thing a developer does when she comes across a, web, a new website is fire up the inspector. So, yeah. so we wanted to add a little something, a little surprise in the, in the code. Yeah, why not use emoji for our classes? And yeah, the emoji was born this way. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. No, I only have five minutes. <laughs> So um, we had different classes, obviously, the header, the footer, a container and a wrapper, the speakers and the sponsors, and the back end and front end. <laughs> so <laughs> So we also obviously combined them, so this would be the image element for the speaker block, which was kind of fun. <laughs> there were some unexpected advantages of using emoji for our classes, which, well, less characters, which is not a big deal, but still it's nice to have. Uh, it forced us to be really, really, really consistent with the class names because it went crazy really fast. So yeah, we needed to use a shared language between all the development team, and obviously it was, it was fun. So am I saying, should you use emoji for your, all your classes from now on? Yes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> we also use quite a bit of SVG um, in many different ways across the site. So we had symbols, uh, we had these gradients in symbols that we could reuse over and over. Um, we animated some things with the little trick that Sarah told, told us yesterday. This is uh, animating the length of the dash, of the stroke, which is cool. Uh, we had some fun things like this uh, polyline that is responsive and adapts to the height and width of the, of the container, of the, of the two containers, which seems obvious, but it's kind of tricky. To do this, you need to add uh, preserve aspect ratio none to the SVG element, and then uh, vector effect, effect of non-scaling stroke to the, to the polyline itself. Because if not, the, the, the stroke width was changing, which is, was not the effect that we were looking for. Um, in the middle of building the site, CSS Grid became available in, in Chrome and Firefox. So CodeGun told us, why don't you use Grid? I was like, yeah, that's a good moment to learn Grid. Yeah, perfect moment. So yeah, we did that. So um, we use CSS Grid on the speaker side, on the speaker's page. And we wanted to be kind of obvious that it was CSS grids, so we did different um, grids for different breakpoints, you can see. Um, so this is not the best way to use CSS grid because one of the good parts is that uh, it does all of the, um, most of the 
calculations of the layout for you. And to do this, we had to do a specific grid for each web point and rewrite all the, all the grid, which was not that fun, but still, we managed to produce a layout that it's virtually impossible to do without CSS grid, which is cool. Uh, also, you can kind of design the grid directly in CSS, so you can plot all your grid spaces in CSS. So you can see what C1 would be the first content, I want the first image of the first speaker, so, and the three dots is an empty space. So you can do that with code. So that's really cool. And well, while doing this, we ran into a lot of bugs because we were using on the speakers page at the same time, uh, grid, flexbox, um, SVG filters, uh, and it, there was an animation at some point and it all crashed. So we kind of had to redesign some things. And I don't know, we wanted to animate mass, but Firefox don't really allow to SVG mass to be animated, which was a bit of a bummer. But still, we had lots of fun, and I hope you like the website. Thank you.